Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special episode of Geek Warning brought to you by the Escape Collective. Uh, this is a special episode uh, that is going to be open only to our members, yeah, at least in full anyway. So for anyone who's not a member, you'll get this for maybe, maybe about half the show or so. Uh, and unlike most of the other special episodes we've done, this is not going to be an Ask a Wrench episode. This is going to be one of our deep dive shows. And I am actually not in Boulder, Colorado at the moment. I just landed in Toronto, Canada about about two hours ago, and I'm now in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, I'm here with Jonathan Kennedy from Framework Bicycles. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, James. This is definitely one of the more unusual environments I've been in to record a podcast. <laughs> um, so I just want to back up just a little bit. Framework Bicycles. So uh, I feel like right now, I guess, could we, could we classify you as Instagram famous at the moment? I don't know. What's the what's the threshold? I feel like that's 10,000 followers. <laughs> okay, so you're maybe not quite there. You're, you're getting there, there. You're getting closer. Thank you. But anyway, this building that we're in at the moment, uh, I am not in a building that says Framework Bicycles on it. Uh, it says Core Print Patterns on the front of this building. Yeah. So what is Core Print Patterns? That is the machine shop, uh, tool and die business, and injection molding facility that we are in. So for the past 10 years or so, that's the business that I've done to pay the bills and keep myself busy. Uh, and it's grown substantially. Well, I wouldn't put it that way. We've added a lot of equipment over the years. Um, it's still just <laughs> Elise and I, and we run a modest business, but we started in like 800 square feet with a little woodworking kind of shop and a small CNC router um, and built it up from there. So all the equipment that you see here has been added through cash flow and just growing the business over the past 10 years. So that kind of culminated throughout the pandemic um, with this injection molding machines that are right beside us right now, where we were doing uh, injection molding work for the Ministry of Health, producing um, PCR testing consumables, so plastic components that the labs were using. Uh, and that was involved and tiring and kind of pushed us to our limits. And so once we got out of the other end of that unscathed, um, I took a little bit of time to work on some personal projects and that's what led to the bikes. Core print patterns, tool and die company. What sort of stuff were you doing here besides injection molding? So the injection molding thing was kind of something that popped the most up recent, yeah. during COVID. What, what have you been doing before then? So the trajectory from the very beginning was we started making foundry tooling. Um, so that's the tool and die aspect of it. The kind of overarching terminology for that is pattern making. So pattern is what a foundry uses to produce the mold into which they make the, a metal casting so you can have reusable or disposable molds or expendable so a lot of the stuff we started doing in the early days was sand casting so the mold is broken each time the metal is taken out of it and the foundry uses a pattern and the, the broken down sand they reclaim the sand um, put new binding agents in it and then pack it into the mold and take it out so it's kind of like a you kind of think of it like those little uh, popsicle things where you got your kid making, put the juice in and you get the part out. So, um, yeah, our it's kind of like one step. You need our tool to make the mold that they put the metal into and the mold gets used every time. So those type of products are often made out of wood, styrofoam, sometimes metal when you get into higher production stuff. So that's why we're able to start with sort of low barrier to entry compared to, you know, a standard machine shop. Um, cause the router only needed to cut foam, wood and things like that. So that's where I started doing a lot of, uh, 3d surfacing and 3d modeling to get that work done. So from there we grew into production machining, um, where most foundries have the requirement to do post-processing on the castings. So typically they're not accurate enough for their final purpose. So they need to have machine features added to them. So we were looking at, um, kind of adding other revenue streams to the business. Cause the thing about tool and die making is you only make one of something. And so you've got to constantly kind of be turning over work and that's okay if your if your customers of foundries are busy and they have people always approaching them for new work. But if they're not that hungry for work, you don't see very much pattern making because they might just make the parts they're already making and that's good enough for them. So, um, we kind of said, we've already got this client base of people who trust us to do complicated work. We can approach them for machining contracts. So that's where we started to add some of the more um, expensive metal cutting machines. And those also allowed us to diversify into more um, expensive tooling 
in terms of the material that they're made of. So higher production stuff is often made out of more robust materials. Um, and the quality of the tooling, if it does cost you more for a quality tool, it can be rationalized and that you're going to be depreciating that over a lot of parts. And you might have cost savings on those parts. So that's where we started to get into the, I would say, uh, differentiating on quality more. Uh, if you're making half a million parts a year off of one pattern and you can save some cleanup time on each of those castings because it's a high quality tool, um, the customer's willing to go for that. So that was a good thing for us. And then we got into uh, die casting and um, other forms of casting like uh, investment casting. So that's where we make an injection mold for a wax part and they use that at the foundry to make the mold. Uh, and then that became injection molding was kind of the final stage of that. The medical components are pretty demanding. Uh, and that's when we added the injection molding machines to produce them. Hence why we're sitting in this basically like big plastic curtain room right now. Yeah. So at least has our office set up in the <laughs> clean room right now since we're not running those products anymore. But yeah, it's pretty good for sound though. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Like, I don't know if the mics can pick it up. Like the compressor kicks on every once in a while or the heat. So yeah, it's nice in here. Clean. Uh, so I guess to to summarize, essentially, you have spent several years now basically just making a bunch of different stuff using a bunch of different methods. Would that be safe to say? Yeah. So I kind of didn't answer that question all that well. And that like what fields were we engaged in might have been something you're interested in. So we general engineering, I would say we did a little bit of aerospace, some medical transportation. We did have our ITAR certification, which is uh, military, but didn't actually end up doing any stuff like that. All the aerospace stuff we did was civilian. Um, so yeah, like when you deal with foundries, you're dealing with any product that might go through their doors. So foundries don't necessarily specialize in um, a particular area of work. Like there are some of the aerospace foundries we worked with. That, that's kind of all they do just because they're such a premium product. But a lot of places, they more specialize in the alloy and the process. So if your end product demands that, you would approach them not because they do, they operate in this arena, but because they make a particular type of component, like maybe small aluminum parts or big iron castings, so things like that. So how, how did bicycles come into this whole thing? Because I think needless to say, that's uh, not really a, a super direct path from one to the other. It is and it isn't. I think there's a lot of overlap between people who are um, working in trades and sort of a hobby that they work on. That could be like a car guy, uh, you know, people who are into tinkering and whatever it might be. So I've always ridden bicycles and it's um, sort of a played out trope, if you will, of like the guy with the machine shop wants to make a product that he's, is also his hobby, right? So golf putters, whatever it might be, right? So bikes was that for me. It was when we finished up the medical project, it was, we were in the pandemic, things were opening up again, but there was still a lot of uh, bicycle supply chain shortages. Uh, at the time I was riding a fixie and that's like less common at the bike shops around here. So i um, trying to source some components for it. It kind of began a little innocently where I just needed like a rear cog on like Phil Wood's website said they were sold out or whatever it was. I thought like, Hey, you're, you're looking, you're, you're looking yeah, my around. back is to a CNC machine that can make this thing. Like, <laughs> don't be lazy. Like the 50 bucks from Phil Wood seemed a lot nicer than figuring out how to make the thing. So uh, I guess that's probably the project that snowballed at all was that. And then I thought like, okay, start looking at the bike. I'm not someone who has an intimate knowledge, of, like a bike mechanics kind of knowledge of how they go together, but I'm fairly capable of like undoing a bolt with an allen key and seeing what <laughs> seeing what happens next um so yeah then then it was make myself a frame after i looked at a couple different building techniques i have very rudimentary welding skills tig and wire feed so i actually had bought a bunch of chromoly tubing um from mcmaster car and thought like put it on the mill figure out how to cope it and weld it together and that kind of sat on the shelf for probably a year or more the whole like super hands-on thing never really appealed to me because um, you have to be on every single time you're trying to do it. A little slip of the finger here and like you either got to backtrack a lot or there's some imperfection in the final part that will always be there and you'll know it's there. So um, yeah, the, the welded bike never really took off. 
And then, yeah, I, I don't know if what happened first, if I tried making the bike the way I did and then someone sent me like Tom Sturdy or Bastion's work, something like that. Um, but I thought it's pretty easy to cut a socket into an aluminum part and plug a carbon tube into it. So I ordered some carbon fiber tubing from McMaster Car this time and bought some aluminum blocks. And by the end of the week, I had a bike frame put together. Super basic because there's no, there's nothing on the frame other than two wheels. Um, so yeah, I ordered a Richie fork and then I had a bike that I was riding around. <laughs> so went out to a couple group rides and people started asking questions about it. Like bike people are, um, for the most part, super supportive and enthusiastic and curious and there are, I think there's a lot of people in the bike world who want to know, like want to have the knowledge and want other people to know they have the knowledge. So when you're riding something that they haven't seen before, I think it's, they're by nature curious and one, like I've, I've been with people who are like, okay, my buddy lives around the corner. We got to go see him. We got to show him this bike. I'm like, okay, this is that, that's probably what led me a little bit into trying to pursue it a bit more deeply. I think had I known that you can have that level and enthusiasm and it doesn't necessarily translate to uh revenue (laughs) (laughs) i might have been a little bit less gung-ho what are you talking about i flew here in my i flew here in my private jet what are you talking about yeah (laughs) g10s in the (laughs) the driveway (laughs) yeah i got a lot of positive feedback about it and i thought like well hey you know you've you've kind of got a bit of free time on your hands right now uh you've got all this equipment that you just paid off and you're enthusiastic like i've always wanted a product to make it's we've only ever done other people's work so yeah i work for myself but i still have masters and still with making bikes that's the case but um i think there's a a, there's a very diversified uh consumer base compared to like we might have had five or ten anchor customers with the core business right but if i sell a bike every couple weeks that's very different than being dependent on one person going under and like we still are operating the other business so partially it's a passion project but also another diversified business stream and i think i do have something to add to the space um i don't think it's just another guy trying to brand a bike um so yeah it it, then i look much more seriously at how do you make a bike with the skills that i have and um like the big thing in machining and kind of general manufacturing in North America is about automation and streamlining and not necessarily removing humans from the equation, but making sure that their contributions are maximized. Can you talk a little bit about how your frames are made? Because like I said early in the episode that you're kind of Instagram famous. You've got a bunch of people following what you do uh, on social media at the moment. Um, but for someone listening to this podcast who is not familiar with what a framework frame is, like what are we talking about? Yeah, so a lot of people think it's a retro thing where I'm doing alloy lugs and carbon fiber tubing. So either the very first genre of carbon bikes um, or more modern, it's most bikes made the similar way are using SLS or direct metal laser sintering for the lugs and then they're bonding in carbon fiber tubes. So my distinction in that area is that we mill all the lugs out of billet 7075. So that's just a aerospace grade, high strength aluminum alloy. Um, and yeah, so the whole thing is done in 3D modeling software first. The bikes are all fully parametric and custom at this point. The machining of the lugs is automated somewhat in the same manner that a 3D printer kind of looks after making uh, the product. You send it the file and the slicer will do what it needs to do. But a lot of the work that went into setting up the this kind of system for making bikes was in developing a robust CAD model for the bike. So that's a 3D model of the bike and then making sure that that workflow carries through into the CNC machining. So the actual programming of the machines is done automatically from inside the same software package. So I'm not like telling the machine what to do every time for a new bike. I just put in the appropriate piece of material for say a head tube, uh, send over the instructions for a given rider's bike. And a couple hours later, I've got a head tube coming out of it. And when you say parametric, what do you mean by that? Parametric is like, let's say you've got an architectural drawing of your house uh, and you want to make your living room 10 feet longer. You just enter 10 feet into the living room dimension and the house drawing will update to accommodate that. You're not starting over from scratch, redrawing your house with that living room. So um, 
yeah, there are a set of parameters that define the 3D model. So that's the parametric aspect of it. Uh, most of them are familiar to anybody who's looked at buying bikes and reads geometry tables. Like the main things that drive it are that kind of 2D sketch of the double diamond shape. Uh, but then we've got a whole host of other things that are some idiosyncratic to our process, but also just little things that the consumer might not think about, like tire clearance, um, the brake caliper or rotor diameter, the bearings we're going to use in the frame. Those are all part of it, the thicknesses of those. And then also the intersection points of where all the tubes come together on the lugs. So you wanted a bit more standover, but you wanted a horizontal top tube. I can kind of drop the whole top tube down on the head tube and it would stick out of like your stem stack would stick out a little bit above that. But all those things are, are built into um, a spreadsheet of variables, basically. So for a new customer, we start by talking about, you know, what style of bike do you want? And then go to fit data and then start to populate all those dimensions for the bike and then send an initial drawing and they might say, you know, that looks good. I would I would like a little bit more, whatever it might be, and we can tweak the drawing. Once it's all approved, then I basically just hit go uh, on the machining of the lugs. So that all happens within about 30 hours of machine time. So there's five distinct parts, right? Your two dropouts, seat cluster, bottom bracket cluster, and head tube. So those are the five components that we machine. Uh, and then the tubes we produce uh, using filament winding uh, to make the carbon tubes. So those are also something we have quite a bit of control over. Uh, speaking about control, or I guess having control over things, I think the one thing that's always, uh, well, I guess one thing that may be really interested in what you're doing is uh, you're essentially doing nearly everything in-house, almost from start to finish, right? Like pretty much in this building that I'm looking at right here, right? Yeah, the only thing we don't do currently is the lugs are all ceramic nickel coated. So it's an electroless nickel process. That's for a couple reasons. The main one being galvanic corrosion with the uh, carbon tubes. Like carbon and aluminum are a mixture that you need to um, know how to handle. It's not like the bike's going to disintegrate, but it's like if you didn't paint your steel bike, it's going to rust, right? There are preventative measures you can take for certain forms of corrosion. So that's one of the steps we take. And yeah, that's a pretty um, specialized process. There's only like one place around us that does that particular product. So, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, we send a batch of bikes and accessories and whatever other parts we might have on the go and they played it. Other than that, yeah, so I don't make aluminum here. I'm not smelting <laughs> aluminum. <laughs> that's uh, probably a good thing. I don't make like pan precursor to make carbon fiber. So <laughs> yeah, we're buying, we buy raw carbon fiber and epoxy and we turn those into tubes. Um, and we take the blocks of aluminum, we turn those into parts, get them plated, and then we paint the stuff in house. And yeah, so we do, we're not buying, uh, it's not like we're buying tubing from someone and cutting it. We're not buying, you know, Paragon Machine Works components and welding them onto the frame. So yeah, there is a high level of stuff we do here, but I don't, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of, um, kind of marketing and branding that goes around like done in house. And I don't really think that that's people who are watching know that. And that's, I don't need to remind you about it, I guess, is my approach. I don't, I don't know why, but yeah, it's, I don't brag about it, but I think it, part of it is, um, wanting to maintain quality, but also wanting to maintain, uh, cost and trying to deliver the absolute best product I can. Like our bikes aren't cheap, but they're, I think, uh, probably unrivaled value in terms of material qualities and construction. Uh, you said early on that a lot of people have this idea that your frames are, are retro. And I think a lot of that probably has to do with sort of just the appearance of it, yeah. um, which, which is completely understandable. Um, how are these not retro though? Uh, well, I think the, the, everyone goes back to your, like everyone's got their brand that they remember, whether it's like the early giant, uh, stuff or a couple of the British brands, like Allen, I think did some like, in like, Vitus, know, yep. Vitus, I don't yep, know. Right. Vitus, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Um, so th those were like, I wasn't really, I was born in 87. So some of those came before me, some came after. So you'll have to uh, help me out a bit here. But I think the reputation with a lot of those was that um, by the time they were potentially having failures, the industry had already moved on from that construction methodology. Uh, my opinion on why that is, isn't because it's necessarily a faulty 
manufacturing process, but because they found a cheaper way to do mass produced frames in terms of all carbon. So they didn't really know how to mold the lugs. Tubes they had a handle on early 90s, right? They were probably all roll wrapped. So I think some of the very early frames probably used cast lugs that would have otherwise been used in the brazing type application. Like they certainly weren't machined or 3D printed they back then. They definitely were not machined so, or printed. Yeah, yeah. so you, the, part of the reason that they might have fallen apart is accuracy and then the alloys that are used in casting are quite different. A lot of those frames just fell apart because of the the, the galvanic corrosion issue too. They, they, yes. It wasn't really something that was on their radar, I think. I don't know. I can't speak to that, what their engineers were aware of. I'm sure that what that was like, uh, I think the same thing happened in aerospace of like, you don't know a problem exists if you don't know it's there. So then once they learn about it, you put fiberglass in or insulating materials or use things with different galvanic potentials. Um, so I think there were probably myriad reasons why they didn't perform that well. Accuracy construction method, bonding agents weren't there, galvanic corrosion. So, and they didn't care to really solve it five or 10 years later because um, they were already making bikes in a way that was probably cheaper. Um, not, not, I don't mean that, uh, like the bikes were probably also better and cost less. Um, if you can mold the entire thing, you're saving some steps. Right. And there's no point in worrying about having to replace an older frame like that with the exact same frame if you can offer a customer under warranty a newer, more modern thing that they might be happier with. Potentially, or they just phase it out altogether. Like I've had some people with, I think BMC has done it more recently with some of their time machine stuff where there was... A, a lot of carbon, but also still some aluminum. And they've said to me like, hey, could you help me? You're doing bikes this way. BMC basically just said, no, we won't even touch it. Um, I don't know. I don't think that indicates that they don't think highly of it, but just that they've moved on. And sure. they don't like whoever their subcontractors were, like it's just like they don't even have that capacity anymore. Um, so yeah, and there, there's a ton of bike brands doing a similar construction methodology right now okay and and most carbon bikes have the same set of joints they're just hidden under sanding and some paint um it's pretty rare to have a full monocoque chassis come out of a mold yeah and it's pretty unusual particularly from a mainstream brand to have a carbon fiber frame that's unpainted because most of the time the reason why those frames are painted is because they want to hide the joints I think to a degree that like we can talk about paint. I'm sure we'll get into it later of why we don't offer a ton of colors, but there, there's a few reasons. Like I, I, I am of the opinion that a, a frame, if it looks raw carbon should at least be clear coated for moisture and UV. Like those are the two things that kill carbon is, uh, yeah, UV will break down the, the matrix and moisture ingress will do the same. So automotive clear coats are engineered to do exactly that, to prevent both against UV and, and water. So, um, I think there is a need to paint a carbon bike frame. You can, there are brands who do it well and are kind of showing off how good they are at carbon by leaving it naked, if you will. Um, you know, like everyone points like time as being people who are quite good at making a carbon fiber bicycle and they leave a lot of exposed areas. I think they're still clear coated or like, you know, high gloss, whatever it might be. So yeah, like there, there are, but even a time bicycle has a ton of joints in it. Like the rear triangles all bonded together. The dropouts are bonded in. So they do the front triangle in one shot. Uh, everything else is sub assemblies and glued together. Gotcha. Um, so, all right. So the frames that you're making, you said you have essentially five CNC machined 70 to 75 aluminum, I guess, you know, nodes yeah, or joints, joints or something. Uh, and then you're using bonded in carbon tubes. Uh, what sort of frames do you make at the moment like what styles of bikes do you have yeah we're in the road to gravel spectrum no, so no suspension right yet. yeah yeah um we could probably throw a suspension fork on one of our gravel bikes it's all coming out of the same parametric model like we don't have a gravel model and a road model um it just really comes down to Part of it is like, what? where do you draw the line in the sand for what you call a road bike or gravel bike, right? Is it head tube angle? Is it, you know, chain stay? Um, so yeah, we're not doing any stuff where we've got like the gravel bike has the drop stay to get in your clearance. We can kind of get around that other ways. So yeah, all the, it's like, if you showed my bikes to a non-bike person, they'd say those are all the exact same bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that kind of leads into what I wanted to ask you because uh, to the more casual observer, like you said, a lot of people think these are kind of retro bikes. Um, and certainly to, like, again, to the more casual observer, they'd be like, okay, these are aluminum parts and carbon tubes. You kind of just glue them together. You're good to go. What would you say makes one of your frames different? Like what, it, I guess, what lies beneath that surface that most people just see initially? 
I think quality in both the materials and the execution of the manufacturing process. So I am not able to tell you that that makes the world's best bike. I can guarantee you that it's an extremely well-made bike, but I think there's a lot of subjectivity in where you take it from there. So the material selection on the carbon was a little bit of a, well, certainly a learning curve in that I had not made uh, carbon fiber tubes before. We did have a little bit of experience in carbon fiber production, mostly um, resin transfer and compression molding tooling. Um, so there's there's a lot that goes into making carbon parts well. And I think there's, um, it's no secret that like, there are some people who think the bike industry doesn't do carbon all that well. Um, now, coming from an aerospace background, the aerospace is not <laughs> perfect either. So it's not like an industry problem. It's more just like a uh, probably, you know, trying to make something on a, at a price point. So there are trade-offs to be made in manufacturing. So for our bikes, I, I wanted carbon um, in the tubing because I really feel that that is the best product for the application in terms of the damping you can get out of it and the differential stiffness, like the uh, anisotropic behavior you can get from it. In the joint areas, um, I'm much happier to use an alloy. First, because I can make those parts on a mill in a way that other people I don't think can. Um, so some of the advantages of doing it that way that we haven't discussed yet are, um, I basically put a raw block of aluminum in the machine and I'm taking out something that is needing no human intervention after that, other than perhaps some minor deburring and then offer plating. So 3D prints take, uh, well, certainly direct metal 3D prints take a ton of work, right? You've got to get the support material off them. Then, you know, a ton of hand finishing and they're not very accurate. You can kind of think of them as like very accurate digital castings. They, it is a casting process in my mind, the solidification that goes on with them. And you are left with a surface that really looks like a sand cast product. So if you want a certain level of fit and finish, you're putting in hours of hand fettling uh, at the, you know, starting with little files and stuff or whatever abrasive media you want to use. So I didn't want people doing tasks like that in the production of the bikes. I wanted it to be let the machines handle the things that the machines are good at and let the humans do the things that the machines can't do. Um, and in doing so, trying to remove or like move that labor cost elsewhere. That whatever, like if you look at most bike construction methodologies, they depend on having a like an army of people. If it's carbon layup, you know, you hear brands brag about, I've got like 700 pieces of carbon, individual pieces that need to be laid in by hand. And from someone coming from a manufacturing background, I just look at that and think like, that's a nightmare. <laughs> you know, like there's no <laughs> chance that you get all of those perfect, right? The more, the more steps you have, the more chance there is for something to go wrong. Oh, hot take because uh, I, again, I'm here in Ontario, Canada and the, and the person, uh, the other company I'm going to go visit is Bridge Bike Works over in Toronto. And uh, they definitely have a whole bunch of little pieces of carbon that are laid in by hand. So it's tough. It's tough to do that in Canada, anywhere in North America, like you need talented labor. You can't just pick someone off the road and say, hey, come make this, this bike for me. So if your head layup guy leaves, you're, you're in a bad position i think so well stay tuned for that episode coming up because i'm gonna go <laughs> ahead over there tomorrow yeah you know, i mentioned earlier that you know I, I'm, I'm in this building you know you and i are in this kind of this clean room setup here um nearly every process that goes into a framework frame is done in-house here in this building in these walls um but the other thing that's interesting about that is uh as far as the fabrication of the frame goes, it, you're it. Like the person that I'm sitting across from right now is the person who is doing the pretty much the entire thing from start to finish, right? Yeah, currently that's absolutely the case. I'm not selling enough bikes to warrant hiring someone. Uh, so, the, and the other thing is like it, it is somewhat hands off. Like my my role in it currently is mostly logistical. I need to make sure the machines have what they need when they need it. So, the workflow from when a customer approves their order is like get the cnc machine running making the lugs i start working on the tubes and that's done on the filament winder so again like i'm using it would be classed as a form of automated fiber placement where i'm not i'm not laying up carbon to make the tubes the machine is doing it with a cnc control super accurately 
um, I just put the resin and the carbon in the machine, let it run the program, and then I transfer that into a mold and pressurize it, let it cure overnight. So part of the production of the tubes was wanting, again, to get rid of any of that sanding. Like you watch video footage of whoever it might be taking a carbon frame out of a mold. Like it's not done when it comes out of the mold for the most part. You've got to deflash it. Maybe you've got parting line pinch you got to clean up. You've got a ton of hand finishing to do just before you bonding your sub-assemblies. And then from there, you've got way more hand finishing and then paint. So um, yeah, you've got labor of assembling the carbon into a mold. And then that that's true of a alloy frame as well, right? Like welding, even if you go to places that are kind of batch manufacturing, you still have, even if your machines are all set up for cutting your tubing notching or whatever, you still have to cut all those tubes, probably deburr them, prep them for weld, get them in a fixture, tack them up, send them out to finish welding. Like that's all just human time along there. And there's no substituting you can't not use skilled people if you want a good product in those processes. So I'm not saying I could have anybody walk in off the street and do what I'm doing, but it's a very scalable process and that um, it doesn't take a huge amount of training to load blocks of aluminum into the CNC machine and kind of make sure the machine's happy while it's running. Uh, some of the more involved processes that we do are the bonding of the frame. And again, that's not, you don't need your 10,000 hours of weld training to be doing that, right? To make a perfect it's like it sounds like essentially most of the work that you've put in a lot of it's on the front end just kind of getting all the systems set up and certainly the programming that sort of thing um but then as far as the production goes i mean obviously you're leaving a lot of that up to the machines but um in terms of the human aspect that's required to go with that i mean would you would you say kind of it's mostly kind of related to like material handling at that point yeah there there's like one way to look at it might be what would my first hire be like, who would I be hiring? And, and honestly, it would probably be someone to handle customer facing things in terms of sales. Like there's as much work in custom bikes just doing the back and forth as there is making the bike for me. Um, it probably takes me um, under 10 hours to make a bike, my total time put into it. The machine time and kind of the waiting for each of those processes stretches that out to with plating and stuff and shipping. Uh, you know, could be two or three weeks to make a bike from when I start to when I finish. Um, but my actual time spent on it is hours. Um, so it might be eight hours of communicating with a customer to make sure everything's perfect before we go ahead and make it. So yeah, I think that would be the first role, but those, that's another thing you can't automate, right? Put people in areas doing things where they're really adding the human benefit to it. Oh, people are trying though. You just haven't found the right large language model yet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chat GPT is still on my bikes. That's what I need. Don't know what the geometry would look like. <laughs> I do use chat GPT a lot. I actually posted about that a bit when I was saying like, could I do some geometry charts for a stock offering using chat GPT to help kind of troll what a gravel bike looks like through the web. And, and I've used it more recently for a lot of like Arduino code on some of the machines we have to make the bikes. So yeah, it's uh it can be a good tool, but you gotta know how to use it. So I don't right. think it's ready to sell bikes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, talk to me about precision because I feel like that's definitely a very big theme of what you're doing here. Yeah, I think precision has a lot of meanings depending on who you're talking to, but I would say control is maybe another thing and not to be like, um, I'm not the guy that's got to be in control. It's about controlling as many of the processes as you can. Like manufacturing, that's all it's about is just, do you have control over your environment, the equipment, how that equipment moves, how your materials are dealt with. So um, to make a good bike, you don't you don't need to do all the things I'm doing, but Doing it the way I do makes me feel confident that every single product that leaves here is sound to the best of my ability uh, and that I'm also delivering exceptional value in terms of the quality of materials that go into it and how they're executed. So, yeah, the a lot of the things we do that are unique to our bikes, like the bearing, um, the choice of headset, bearing assembly and bottom bracket, those are kind of secondary to how we've chosen to do it. They kind of fall out of the process if you were to say i want you to machine in my welded bike proper press fit bearing like a proper bearing assembly in the bottom bracket you add a ton of cost to the bike but like i'm already putting the lug in a cnc machine that's capable of you know that order of magnitude of accuracy or greater so it doesn't cost me any more to add some really accurate precise features to the bikes and again i'm not going to say that that makes it you know, you need to have my bike because the bearings will spin freely, but I can have the bike leave and say, I bet you, you're going to have better bearing performance than pick 
company X's super nice, nice bearings, whatever they are, in a misaligned frame. I mean, that is something that we deal with a lot in the bike industry, though. So just to back up just a little bit, when we talk about precision for you in terms of how things are machined, what level of precision are we talking about? Probably most of your listeners are metric, right? <laughs> so I'm going to say in microns, 5 to 10 micron might be a pretty... You know, the press fit bearings we're going for, I, I'm thinking imperial, so I'm going for like two tenths. So I think that's, yeah, five or six microns. If I've got my conversion correct. So yeah, like uh, like the machines we have are top notch. You don't necessarily need them to make a bike uh, the way we're doing it, but we had them and it works as sort of the uh, give a baby a hammer and everything's a nail. <laughs> like part of, part of the way I'm building a bike is using the skill set and resources that I have at my disposal and the things that I know I can do really well. I didn't want to have another welded bike where I'm differentiating on marketing. Like I really wanted the product to kind of stand on its own for how it, how we go about making it and the things we care about when we're, and that isn't to say that there aren't a ton of other great bike manufacturers who care and put accurate work into it by any means. I just wanted to have it kind of, foolproof in a way not that it is like you can always find a way to screw stuff up but i if i'm having a bad day the cnc machine doesn't care it's still going to do a really good job uh so yeah we can maintain a really high quality of product have control over costs and hopefully run a profitable business making bikes which is hard to do uh and just to clarify when you say two tenths you mean two ten thousandths right? yeah okay point zero 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 two inches right because people who don't think in that those sorts of manufacturing tolerances i could certainly i could certainly see someone being like two tenths of an inch that's huge like yeah. can do that no, with no, a it, it's uh yeah sorry my my i think it's micron it, it it would be like a h7 fit or whatever you need for a bearing press fit on the actual race right so that that's no, I'm not machining the entire lug to that type of tolerance, but the features that need to have that. And then there's like, if you get into bearing fit, it's the size of the hole is a very small part of it. Like having a round hole is another part of it. Having those two holes be perfectly coaxial is probably the hardest part. You can make two really round things on the other side of the frame, but it could be shaped like a banana if you look at it in terms of the axis that those go through. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, because we do that stuff for a living, uh, make really high tolerance parts. It's kind of second nature and it doesn't, like we're not belaboring that. Um, so I think it's an important aspect of what might differentiate our bike, but I'm not like saying like this is the best bike because we've got really nice bearing alignment in it. Sure. No, I mean, I, I know that you've always been very careful to not characterize what you're doing as sort of like the absolute best. There is no best bike. Well, and, and I also feel thing. like you're, you're, you're really careful to not even say that what you're producing is necessarily like better than something else. Uh, I, I guess to some extent, but as far as the, like what you were talking about a minute ago with, uh, like the bearing tolerance, uh, bearing board tolerances and stuff like that and the concentricity and, and, you know, kind of where they sit in space and that sort of thing. Um, that is definitely something that we do deal with a lot in the bike industry. I think most people listening to this, to this podcast will, they've certainly had issues with, you know, press fit bottom bracket tolerances or definitely. bearings that go bad prematurely or, you know, a creaky headset or like, you know, a bunch of you know, like a big gap between a headset top cap and the frame, just stuff like that. Like it's, it's people talk all the time about having these issues with bearings, but I feel like oftentimes when they say that they're having issues with bearings, what they're having an issue with really is the seats that those bearings are sitting in. Right. Yeah. It's like in engineering, you talk about like, what's your frame of reference. Right. So I, I think that that's a huge reason that you have steer tube failures. I know you're the not internal guy, but I think that a lot of it actually has to do with um, if the two bearing seats in your frame where the, and because those bearings are particularly bad at, they kind of will follow whatever path they want to because they're not quite acting like a spherical washer, but you have two chamfers that are not going to sit like a CNC spindle is going to hold a taper, right? They'll rock in there and they'll kind of, the, the principle is probably, like elastic averaging, they're going to, like if your steer tube isn't perfectly straight, the inner races are going to kind of conform to that. If your head tube on your bike isn't perfectly straight, the outer races are going to kind of conform to that. And when you start to preload everything, you've got things that are fighting in opposite directions. Like it's, I'm sure everyone that's tinkered with stuff knows like, oh, this was free spinning. And the second I tightened something down slightly, it all locked up what happened. Um, and that's just because 
when you didn't have it preloaded, there's a little bit of float, but those things weren't perfectly aligned to begin with. So once you tighten them up, they're going to lock up. So yeah, like examples like facing brake mounts, you know, why can't I get my brake rotors to not rub somewhere? And probably something's not perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And there's, yeah, it's, it's hard to make a mass produced frame um, and have all that stuff totally nailed unless you're going to do um, kind of a post-assembled cleanup on everything. So in a welded frame, everything's going to move when you weld. I don't care how good a welder you are or if you've got, you're starting to integrate a lot of um, SLS prints into it and you can kind of move the heat affected zone away from, say, like look at Tom Sturdy's bottom bracket cluster. When he welds that up, he's probably got way, like orders of magnitude less distortion in the actual shell than someone who's got to weld the chain stays right to a sleeve of metal, right? So that's going to move a lot less, but it's still going to move. The saying in machining is like, if you, if you can't, if you can't notice it, you're just not, you don't have an accurate enough measuring tool. So um, I don't think bikes need that level of precision to work properly, but um, yeah, the, there's all the frustrations you're describing exist, but there's also not really an effective way for a consumer or your average bike shop to measure those things. So t for me saying I can do that, it's like, what's it worth if no one can, no one's going to take my bike frame and put it in a CMM and like check everything, <laughs> right? Like that's. But I guess the thing is, again, like what I was talking about with, you know, so many people having issues with various types of bearings on their frames. Mm -hmm. If you start with a correct foundation in terms of those bearings being exactly where they're supposed to be, then, you know, essentially this is sort of like a tolerance stack up issue, right? Like yeah. you just start compounding these issues as you, as you start putting more and more things on, as you start installing more parts. Um, so, you know, like you, you say, like you don't really make a huge deal out of the precision thing, but I mean, it is kind of a big deal, don't you think? Like it, like it, from a from a consumer standpoint, it's the it's the idea that you very potentially could have fewer problems with some sort of spinning component further down the road because those bearings are where they're supposed to be to begin with. I am one hundred percent confident that it's the right way to do it. You do remember me saying at the beginning of this episode that only Escape Collective members were going to get the whole show, right? Well, sorry, but this is the end of the road for you today. That is, unless you head over to escapecollective.com slash join and sign up. I've gone through the process myself. It is super quick. And in fact, if you head over there right now, I promise you can be back here in less than five minutes to hear the rest of what Jonathan had to say.